Hello and welcome to Capitol Hill. I'm Lyndall Curtis. With the government's legislation to reinstate offshore processing of asylum seekers making its way through the Senate, the issue today hasn't just been confined to that chamber. A merchant ship, a sister ship of the Tampa, which arrived off the Australian coast in 2001 and effectively kicked off John Howard's Pacific solution, rescued 67 asylum seekers on Tuesday and brought them to Australia after those rescued threatened self-harm when they were first told they were going to be taken to Singapore. To discuss this and other issues of the day, I've been joined by Nationals MP Darren Chester and Labor MP Sid Sidebottom. Welcome to you both. Thanks very much. Good afternoon. We'll start off with the rescue by the MV, MV Passful and the reaction from the opposition. It shows you just how dangerous it can be out on the high seas when you've got desperate people doing dangerous things. And that's what happened here. Uh, it tells you how dangerous potentially towing a boat back to Indonesia can be as well when people behave like this. But there's no advantage in that sort of behaviour. There's no advantage in it because these people now face the prospect of going to Nauru. At the very least, this matter should be thoroughly investigated uh, and it should be thoroughly investigated by the police. Um, intimidating the captain of a ship uh, is no light matter. Uh, it is unlawful to intimidate the captain of a ship. Um, on the basis of what we were told by Minister Clare today, uh, an unlawful act has occurred at sea and that should be dealt with by the police. Uh, as I said, the difference is John Howard met the Tampa uh, with the SAS. Julia Gillard met the Parsifal with a welcoming committee. Sid, this issue has been running for a very long time. The, the debate over asylum seekers, uh, we've seen today echoes of the Tampa, certainly the opposition's uh, trying to, to um, bring it back into the debate. You come from a regional electorate in Tasmania. What do your electors, electors think about this debate and the way it's being had? Yeah, sure. I, I, I think in the main, uh, people want something done about it. And it, it, they feel the tension, like everyone else does, between looking after people as people, these are human beings, but at the same time, uh, they're very concerned that people lose their lives at sea. And so they want the Parliament of Australia, Liberal, Labor, Califumpia, and whoever it is, uh, to do something about it. And, uh, and I think that's uh, a, a humane uh, and realistic view of where people stand on this. Get it fixed do something about it, but look after people as well that are here. Darren, you have a very similar electorate. Do your, do your voters have the same sorts of views? Oh, there are strong views in the electorate. There's no question about that. The, the great angst, I suppose, in, in more recent years has been the concern that there hasn't been a strong border protection regime in place and people have been concerned that boats seem to have been able to turn up willy-nilly, and that has been a concern to, to many people. Uh, but I think... It is a very serious issue, it's a very complex issue, and I think we've made some great steps this week, and hopefully we're going to go forward from here in a very mature way. And, and the developments today, I think, uh, are further proof that we have a very, a very complex problem, and we don't want the situation where people seeking asylum or the people smugglers themselves can dictate terms, whether it be to the Australian government or to a merchant vessel in this case. It, that was a very worrying development in the past 24 hours, and uh, hopefully there'll be a full investigation. And if there are charges to be laid, they should be laid, and, and, and the... Uh, and any uh, offenders should be prosecuted uh, appropriately. There, there's no denying that this debate has been highly political for a very long period of time. Uh, uh, Darren, I ask this to you. Is, is the opposition leaders drawing comparisons between the way John Howard handled the Tampa and the way um, the Prime Minister has, has handled the most recent arrival of a merchant vessel? Is that in some, in some instances trying to get people to think that, that Mr Howard dealt with this very strongly and, and cast doubt on how the Labor government would handle it? I'll, I'll leave it to the political commentators to decide what tactics are being used or whatever. But the, the point that needs to be remembered was that when Kevin Rudd came in as Prime Minister there was a solution in place and he thought he had the opportunity to change that arrangement and it ended up causing more of a problem than, than perhaps he anticipated. And I don't say that with any triumphalism, I'm not saying that to uh, try and score a point. It's a simple fact that boats started arriving again after we made our laws a bit softer. And there's no question that uh, there was a strong feeling in the community and a strong feeling in the Parliament that we had to do something about it. Uh, in the search for uh, perhaps 
more humane laws is what the, uh, the the government of the day was seeking we actually created a situation where more people put their lives at risk and we had the tragic situation of people dying at sea and and no one on any side of the of politics has taken any joy from that and i think the uh the ministers and the shadow ministers over the recent weeks have worked very well to try and come up with some sort of solution and i believe the um, the panel's report has provided something of a circuit breaker it's allowed us to get something through the house of reps and start working now in a way that we can do uh, do the best by the australian nation I think it's been it's been a good week, uh, but there's a long way to go. Sid, would it be unrealistic to say that politics has played no part in the government's change of heart on this? Your position is now diametrically opposed to that that was taken to the 2007 election, and it has been a political problem for Labor. Has has part of the change of heart been to to get it off the table, to deal with it, so it's not such a heated political issue anymore? Well, th that may be an interpretation of some. And, uh, and in a sense, I agree with Darren that what I think has been the main stimulus to this last round of trying to uh, to do something practical, something that we can realise together, and 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 stemming from the Houston uh, report, is that. 600 people or more mm. have lost their lives and I think sitting in Parliament doing what we do in politics and politicking on a number of things reaches a point where you say enough is enough and that's what I think has driven this more than anything. Now others can have their own conclusions but if we can save one life one life by agreeing on a policy where we can process people uh, and do it in an equitable way with those that are offshore and seeking uh, resettlement in Australia, then I think that's a good thing. It's not even easy. If it, even if it's at the cost of some people spending what may be a very long period of time in places like Nauru or Manus Island? Well, well again, that, that's where to see how that plays itself out and uh, and the minister has discretion on that as I understand it uh, currently. The important thing is how do you balance these things realistically, practically and I think uh, you know we've lost 600 people or more and we want to be able to create a system where people who are in an industry of people smuggling right do not have incentives or continue to have incentives to bring people over here and in such unsafe ways. We might move on to another issue of the day. Uh, the Prime Minister's Manufacturing Task Force delivered her a report today on the way forward for the struggling sector. A million Australians work in manufacturing. I want to make sure that we are working with our manufacturing industries today during the days of the resources boom and that we still have a strong manufacturing sector in the future in the days that lie beyond the resources boom. This is a blueprint or a roadmap for the future. Now it will only succeed if we can continue to engage constructively and work together. That's industry, employers, with government. Now again for both of you, uh, similar electorates with manufacturing in them. Darren, given, given the impact of the high dollar on the manufacturing sector, do you think there, there are realistically other things that can be done to help manufacturing? Oh undoubtedly. I, I've got my reservations about the report. I've only had a chance to read through it briefly today. It, it seems to me more of a talk fest. We've got working groups, task force, we've got consultation engagement, but at the end of the day we need to actually have some action from government and the first bit of action we'd like to take if we have the opportunity to form government would be to get rid of the carbon tax. I, I, I accept entirely that the high dollar has an impact on manufacturing, but why make it harder? Why make it harder for Australian manufacturers to compete overseas by imposing a carbon tax on these But even if the businesses? carbon tax comes off, you're still left with the problems created by the high dollar and they're much more significant, aren't they? Oh, I think there are some very significant challenges facing manufacturing and I look at things like the relatively high labour costs in Australia. An issue that doesn't perhaps get as much coverage as it should is our transport and road network uh, and the costs that are embedded in that for the manufacturing sector. We've got a lot of work to do on our regional and rural road network and I'm sure that uh, uh, Sid would be aware as well as he's travelled around Australia. There's some sections of road throughout regional Australia which are making it very difficult for the manufacturing sector, for the agricultural sector to get their products to market. So we have some very big challenges. It's not just about the carbon tax, I accept that, uh, but there are some there's, some there's some need for action in a whole range of areas and I'm, I'm afraid that at this stage we've had a lot of talk but at the same time 125,000 people have lost their jobs since the global financial crisis. Uh, the time for talk so we need some action. Uh, Sid, despite Darren saying that there's too much talking going on, the report did make a lot of of the connections between people, the connections between industries and also between 
researchers and industry, if those connections were stronger, do you think manufacturing industries, particularly like those in, in your electorates who may yeah. not have um, such close contact with, with what other industries are doing, might benefit, might be able to learn something? Look, look indeed, I think one of the things that the, the massive global pressure is placing on manufacturing, particularly in Australia, for a whole variety of reasons. I know Darren has to talk about the carbon tax, and OK, or the price, and, and that may ha have an effect. But what I think it's tending to do is it's affecting the way people actually produce and work together. It's actually bringing about what I call collaboration and clustering in industry now, more and more. Because, you know, if you look at it, a lot of the competitive costs are in transport, IT systems in repeat, uh, repetitive uh, manufacturing processes. And I think even in my own region, where people are now beginning to collaborate in terms of the inputs that go into their business and sharing, uh, that's one way of actually starting to tackle, uh, you know, the manufacturing thing. The other thing is the things that we manufacture, right, we need high value, mm. right, uh, probably lower volume, high value, uh, in order to compete and export to the rest of the world and understand what the world wants. The, the report, though, does pick up on some of the things Darren talked about. It talks about spending, uh, particularly in infrastructure, isn't the reality at the moment that the federal government really doesn't have enough money, doesn't have the money available to, to speed up investments in infrastructure. Well, and also research and development is a really important area, you know, very, very key. Uh, I would have to say, and I say it's very political, but I have to say in comparative terms what we've spent on in investment in infrastructure compared to the 10 years before we came into government is astronomically high. Not enough won't be enough and we've got to work at different ways of actually getting investment in infrastructure, not just government taxpayer investment, uh, but partnerships, equity partnerships, partnerships with private uh, concerns as well. We've got a lot more to do. And Darren, can you can you see if, if there was uh, some more effort put into collaboration, maybe more effort put into infrastructure, that, that more manufacturing industries would be able to um, open in, uh, to expand in oh, electorates like yours? Oh, I'm, Look, I, I'm an eternal optimist. I have a very diverse electorate. I have Australian paper manufacturing going on. I have a sustainable hardwood timber industry. I have a dairy industry. So I have a very diverse electorate. Uh, I think one of our great challenges, and I, I welcome to sit into my electorate only a, a couple of weeks ago and we had a look around at some of the, the operations we do have there. And one of the areas that we really need to work on as a nation is our access to the Asian markets in terms of our, tr our trade agreements. At the moment, the, uh, the dairy industry is, is suffering as a result of New Zealand having better access to China than we do. Now, Fonterra is a massive company. You don't need to give Fonterra any more advantages than it already has. So we need to find ways to get our products into the growing Asian market. And I think that's a really a really serious challenge. These are, these are big challenges for government that are going to be, last beyond the current government, into the next government and into the future. These are big challenges. I might ask you both a quick question without notice uh, because we're running out of time, but you were saying beforehand you went to the ASEAN areas. Was that a worthwhile trip? Oh, absolutely. The messages were Australians are clever, good producers, have food security, we want to be partners with you, we wish you'd come over here and study and live and understand us better and also communicate with us better. And so my conclusion was, yeah, we're clever, but are we smart? Yeah. And I think they were saying become smart as well as clever. Yeah, a very, a very valuable experience and I think one great opportunity is to get some more of our students studying in Asia and understanding Asia. That's where we'll have to leave it, Darren Chester and Sid Sidebottom. Thank you very much for thank your time. You. And thank you for joining Capitol Hill. Please be with us at the same time tomorrow. Good night.